First of all, I want to introduce myself. My name is Joe Croft, and I am presently the chairman of the board for Northeast Ohio Bible College. And I'm here to represent Northeast Ohio Bible College because we recognize with this uh, time of uncertainty that a lot of the churches that the uh, Sunday schools are not there right now. So we decided as a college to bring Sunday school to the churches. So we're glad to have you. And I want to thank Farron, and I want to thank the Restoration Church of Christ for uh, having this venue that we can do this for you and for the uh, our sister and brother churches that we have. So during this time, I always say that because a lot of people are getting upset, they're getting nervous, and you know, you know, and you're all shaking your head. Yeah, we know all those people. And I like to say it this way: If you're familiar with the prophet Habakkuk or Habakkuk, he was tremendous because. When times were difficult and it seemed like God wasn't there, and he kept saying, like, God, where are you during this difficult time? You know what happened? God said, Habakkuk, you take care of what you're supposed to be doing here on earth. Be trustworthy, be loyal, do your part, and leave the CEO of the universe up to me, and I'll take care of it. So I think we as a nation during this difficult time we need to follow suit. We need to do what we're supposed to do and let God take care of the things he is going to do. And isn't it nice that God is in control? Yeah. Amen? Amen? God is in control. Um, Sunday school, I think, is a vital part of a worship service. So one of the reasons I'm here is because I believe so much in Sunday school. And I think that bringing Sunday school to the churches will be vital. So here's the deal there. Let me give you a little story. And you all know in Acts 8, Philip and the eunuch. Remember that story that the eunuch was sitting in his chariot, reading the book of Isaiah. And Philip was directed, and he goes up to him and said, Hey, what are you reading? So I'm reading the book of Isaiah. And he said, Do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how am I going to understand what I'm reading if someone doesn't teach me or guide me? And so I think in, for, for Sunday school, that's what we have to have. We have to have teachers, and we have to have people like you who are readily participants and, and in mind who wants to learn and learn and apply the knowledge so that you can teach others. See, my job is to teach you and your job is to one day be a teacher, if you're not already, to become a teacher because all our jobs are to be evangelistic and teach others about the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And all God's people said? Amen. 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 So, last but not least, uh, if you like this class or if you have a question, you may call me or email me. Let me give you my email address. It is Joe Croft, that's J-O-E. C R O F T at N E O B C, which stands for Northeast Ohio Bible College, at N E O B C dot org, or G. Now, if you don't like the class, what, what's that again? <laughs> whether you like the class, <laughs> if you like the class, email me at Joe Croft, J O E C R O F T. At N E O B C N E O B C again North East Ohio Bible College dot uh, okay. org. And again, if you don't like the class, or you know you have negative comments, I want you to email Don Cooper at <laughs> I don't care dot com. <laughs> so good luck with that one. Huh? I'm glad you'll get those emails. So. We're going, to, we're going to study the book of Philippians. And again, class participation is more than welcome. I would appreciate that. But I want you to understand the book. I want you to understand how to apply that knowledge of the book into your lives. And so that we as a church can be better to our communities and to each other. All right. So let's, let's start with the, the questions here. So first of all, a 
Excuse my writing, by the way. I remember that from you. Yeah. yeah. Who, who wrote that book? Who wrote the book of Philippians? Paul. Paul. That was an easy one, right? Are you sure? Yes. What's yes. that read? Paul. <laughs> well, <Yeah. laughs> well, if you want to read 1 1, what's it say? And Timothy. Oh, Paul and Timothy. Timothy. Yes. So who wrote it? Paul and Timothy. Well, we got a difference now, don't we? We'll get there. Well, let's let's we'll do it now. That's fine. So every once in a while, I'm going to try and sound smart. So I know every once in a while, Paul and Timothy. Paul wrote the letter. Okay. And Timothy is what's called an, an amanuensis, okay? An amanuensis. And that means when somebody is dictating, he's writing it. So how do we know that it was Paul who wrote the letter and not, as Jessica said, Paul and Timothy? I'll direct you really quick. Look at verse three. Does it not say, I thank my God? Right? In verse 4, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer. Verse 6, for I am confident. If it was both people writing the letter, wouldn't it be we and our? So it is more likely that Paul wrote the letter and Timothy was, in essence, uh, a scribe who wrote down the words of Paul. So we got who wrote the letter? To whom? Who did you write it to? Philippians? Just all of Philippians? Come on, I'm going to ask, you know, I, I always got to make people think. So what does the verse say? To do, who did he write it to? To all the saints. To all the saints. To the church. All the saints who are in Philippi. Yeah. Right? So let's talk about that. If you're going to write a church to the saints, let's talk about, if, you know, we write to the saints. In Philippi. One L, two P's. Say, say yes. Yes. All right, thank you. I appreciate that. Sometimes I get those mixed up. So let me ask you this. Who's a saint? Isn't that an interesting term? Because in today's world, the word saint is totally different than sometimes. What's the biblical definition of saint? Or let me ask you this in a different way. What's an interchangeable word for the term saint? Says holy. That's excellent. Thank you. What else? Refers to all the mind of notice. Refers to all Christians of the, of the community. Bingo. Of the community. So we have saints, right? Mm -hmm. An interchangeable term is Christian. Mm -hmm. So if you're a Christian, you're a saint. You with me? Yep. And if you're a saint, you are a holy one. The term, the Greek word for for saint is hagios, which means holy ones. So, what kind of Bible you got there, Mr. Albright? What version do you have? Okay, so they're the holy ones, but it requires holy means it's the it's from the word sanctified, Latin term sanctified. What does that mean to be holy? We're going to go through a lot of terms in the beginning so we get kind of rounded in some of these terms. I want you to understand them so that as you read the book. But let's talk about that term. What does it mean to be holy? And don't anybody say it means to be like fair because you know, <laughs> you get there. To follow Christ. I would think okay. follow the word, follow the instruction. Usually if you're a follower of Christ, we're called disciples because we're followers of Christ, right? Like we're disciples. So let me help you. Set apart. Set apart. From what? From common service, like the world, right? The world is it, they're in common service. 
were set apart from the world for service to him, to Christ. That's being holy. What else? There's three of them. How about if I told you it means to be pure or to be free from sin? That would make you holy. And we have to do everything in our life to be free from sin or to be pure or to be holy. And last but not least, the last term is to be dedicated. Dedicated means not one hour of service at the church. It's 168 hours in a week. And if we're going to be good at being a follower and, and to be holy, it's going to be dedication so that we can learn and apply it and become closer and to be imitators of Jesus. That's what it means to be holy. So he writes the letter to uh, Paul, Paul and Timothy, or Paul, writes to the saints, right? When did he write it? See all these questions? In every book that you study, I would, I would advise you strongly to, to ask all these questions up front so that when you get a lot of these answers, the scriptures become enlightened to you. Anybody know when he wrote the book? I, I have a question. Yes, sir. My Bible goes on to say after that, including the elders and deacons. Why yes. Why does he separate those out? I'm going to get there. Oh, you're not there. Don't rush. <laughs> That's on page three of my notes, but I'm going to get there. <laughs> All right, let's talk about when he wrote it. Anybody know? Have an idea? Approximately 61 AD. <laughs> I'll, I'll think approximately 62, 63 AD, which is kind of neat because if you think about it, when Paul first went to Philippi, first of all, he was he was called there in a vision. He was going to go to Bithynia, and he got a vision and said, "Hey, come on over here." And so he followed and went to the area called Macedonia. Philippi is Macedonia is northern Greece. Achaia is southern Greece, and he was called to Macedonia, which Philippi is part of northern Greece or, or Macedonia. So he's called there, and he went on a second missionary journey about 52 AD. So you have to understand the second, this, his third missionary journey was about 57 AD, and now it's about 62. So this is 10 years, he's writing this letter about 10 years after he originally went on his missionary journey. Now let me, let me just take a quick thing for you. You know Paul went on three missionary journeys, right? Mm -hmm. So the, a good way to remember the journeys are in threes. His first missionary journey was in Acts 13, 14, and 15. The second missionary journey was 16, 17, and 18. And let's follow along. And the third missionary journey actually starts at the end of 18, I think it's 1823, but 1920 and 21. So if I said, if I was teaching, say, hey, but I followed on a second missionary journey, you would know where to look in Acts 16, 17, and 18. So it's kind of a neat way to remember the missionary journeys. So it's about 62 AD or 10 years after he visited. So let me ask you this. From where is Paul writing that letter? Yes, he was in prison where? In a jail cell. In a jail cell. <laughs> you say that? <laughs> you get an A for this class, huh? He's in a Roman prison. He's in Rome. Which, if you, I don't have a, uh, a map for you, but from Philippi is almost directly west, and you go up north a little bit, but it is west. And the really neat thing about the importance of Philippi 
And hopefully I'm not boring you too much, but the, the importance of Philippi, there was a main road that went from Asia to Europe, where Rome is, and it was called the Via Ignatia, and it went right through Philippi. So the really neat thing about Paul going to Philippi is that's where people were. There was a lot of people there. And so when he went there, if you're going to preach, right? Mary would look, rather preach in front of 500 people instead of five. That makes sense because now you have a better opportunity to reach the lost. Well, Paul had the, that philosophy, let me go where they're busy. And probably he saw a vision going, hey, there's, they need some help here. Come on over here. Any questions so far? No? No. So we'll ask this one last question and we'll get started into the book itself. Why did Paul write that letter? What's this book really about? And Robert, you're part of the missions group, right? Mm -hmm. Good. Oh, another. Oh, we got the good. This is great. We were all about us. This, this, we won't be playing bigger. We'll get me out. It's all good. You just want to ask a question and go, maybe. All right. Why did you write that letter? I think he wanted to um, tell him that he was in prison and he was going to be tried and um, they're, they're going to have problems in the future too. The Philippian church was not the most richest body around. But when they found out that Paul was in prison, and by the way, when you're in prison, you pay rent. You pay to be in prison. I like that. But when they found out that he was in prison, they decided to send Aphroditus, a, a member of that congregation, to Rome to have a, a sum of money to help him. Now, how cool is that? Now, think about that. Take one of your church leaders in this church, right? Found, find out that he's now in prison and maybe going to face death. Do you think you might want to help? Do you think you have love and concern for that person who did so much for you? Because without Paul, maybe there wouldn't be a church in Philippi. Maybe there wouldn't be people going to heaven. But they said, Lay, let's do our part and help this gentleman. So they sent Epaphroditus to Rome to help Paul. It is a letter of love. It's probably the most affectionate letter that Paul wrote in all its epistles. It is a book of unity. And it is a book of humility. What I mean by humility is to have the mind of Christ. And we're going to get in chapter 2, we're going to talk about what it means to have humility and have the mind of Christ. You might get to chapter one, verse one. Now. <laughs> Does this help you? Yes. yes. I think it, see if you understand why the book is written and where he at. He's in prison. I think it just helps you when you read the book to get some kind of idea of who the, who he's writing to and the purpose of it. So let's get right to the. Um, let me erase this. Anybody have any more? Need this before I erase it. All right, we have fun yet? Mm -hmm. Cool. All right, one one. Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Christ Jesus to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, and Robert here we come, including the overseers and deacons. So bond servants, who are bond servants? I mean, they are bound to the service. If you're a bond service, you're bound to the service for him. I'm sorry? Are they voluntary? 
Are they voluntary? Well, sure they are. Because they can voluntarily get out of it if they wanted to. But they, to talk about dedication, they said, okay, we are now a Christian. We are now bound to the service for our king. They made that commitment, that dedication in. So is that what point were you trying to say? It was more of a statement than a question. Oh, okay. All right. Of Christ Jesus. So let's talk about that term Christ. And I'll get out of the way. Three terms. Messiah, Christ, and anointed. What's the difference? That's the Jewish term. When the Jews look for the promised Messiah, that's what they call the Messiah. When you read Matthew, they talk about the Messiah. So this is the Jewish term or the Greek term, Christ. So we go from <laughs> Jewish to Greek to the term anointed. So the English word anointed. They all mean the same thing. When you say Messiah, when you say Christ, it means he is the anointed one of God. Jesus is the anointed one of God. Now, if you look at the, the offices in the Old Testament that you had to be anointed, they were prophet, priest, and king. And guess what? Jesus is the only one who fulfilled all three. If you look at Deuteronomy 18, 15, and 18, 18, he said it was a prophet after Moses. Uh, in Hebrews, I think it's in 5, that he was a priest after the order of Melchizedek. And of course, he was in the line of the kingly line of David. He's the only one. So, Bond serves of Christ Jesus to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, including the overseers and deacons. I looked a long time for this one. I wonder why he included the, the overseers and deacons. Well, first of all, who's an overseer? One is bishops. Bishop, yep. Yeah, it's the Greek term episkopos, which means bishop, the English term bishop, that's correct. What, what version do you have? Jesus. All right. We'll go with that. See, I'm not one of those guys. If you've got a Bible, I'm happy. Bishop. What, what other term is defined as a bishop? Elder. Elder, Elder overseer, bishop. They are interchangeable terms. And a deacon uh, means minister or servant. Okay, so why then is Paul then giving notice to the overseers and deacons? Because he wrote to all the saints are in Philippi. And that's why. But it includes the elders and the overseers and the deacons. And I'm just wondering, I wondered why he made such a point to include them. Think about this, Mr. Missionary Guy. So if you want to support, Paul was a missionary, right? And they wanted to support him, so they did. Now, you have a missions group, right? And you decide what missionaries you're going to support. Now, when you decide to come up with these different entities that you will or won't support, who do you go to? Do you just go, yeah, we're just going to send 100 bucks a week to... ABC, right? Who do you go to? And that goes to? Yeah. The elder? Right. <laughs> so 
if, if Paul's going to be supported, he knows he has to have the okay from the leadership of that church. Otherwise, it, so I'm thanking you that you sent Epaphroditus to me with this nice sum of money to support me. And thank you, elders and overseers and deacons, that you thought of me. Because they're the decision makers. So I think that's why Paul gave them notes. Any questions before we move on to two? Okay, verse two. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I like this because you see that greeting. Once we get the from and the to, then you get the what's called the greeting or the salutation. Grace to you and peace from God our Father. So let me ask you this. We're either Jew or Gentile. Can we agree with that? No different. We're either Jew or Gentile. So if you are a Gentile, the term and the greeting grace to you is a familiar one with you, to you. I mean, I hope it's all as well. So if you're a Gentile and you're reading this book, you can identify with them. And that's a good thing. You don't want to read the book and go, this isn't for me. And the term peace from God our Father, the term peace, if you're not a Gentile, you are what? A Jew. Well, the word peace was a common greeting to a Jewish brother. Peace or shalom. So whether you are a Jew or Gentile, isn't it nice to know that that greeting is for you? What's grace? Wait, don't say the first name of Cal. <laughs> sort of a forgiveness. Um, something on that nature. Okay. God's riches at Christ's expense. That's pretty good. I like that one. I've never heard that one, but I like it. God's riches at Christ's expense. Sorry. Yeah. Well, most people define it as, and it's true, which is undeserved or unmerited favor. That's when you ask people, that's kind of like the, the point phrase. And I like to do, say it this way to you it is God doing for you what is utterly impossible for you to do on your own. Now, let me give you an example. Salvation. You can never earn salvation. It is utterly impossible for you and I and we to earn our salvation. Only through the grace of God and His Son Jesus can we obtain salvation. Grace. And the term peace, peace is when you are well off with God. Now, a lot of people are saying, well, I'm at peace now. I, the peace that comes from God is the, peace, is the peace that despite all kind of chaos, which in this world right now, we have a lot of chaos, right? And a lot of things that are going on that we don't like. But when you have peace, the peace that God gives you, that you are well off even in times of chaos and stress. That's peace. That's the peace that comes from God. And it's nice, that the greeting that he gives, Paul's not the giving the greeting from him and Timothy. Look where that greeting comes from. That greeting is from, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'll just say this to you about God the Father. When the Jews thought of God the Father, they looked at him as a protector, a provider, and a comforter. And we dads, that we'd like to think that too, right? We are a provider, we are a protector, and we're a comforter. And that's how the Jews looked at God the Father. And since the term and, which is a correlating conjunction, there's equal parts. So Jesus is not any less than God the Father. And I like that term that he's, 
him the equal uh, notoriety here. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, verse, verses 3 through, this time goes too fast. Can we go for like three hours, Aaron? I was going to promise to try and get through, uh, through 11 verses. I don't think that's going to happen today. But the section, I, I, I want to do these in sections. Because 3 through 11 is the prayer of thanksgiving that Paul has for the Philippians. 3 through 11 is a section of itself. And then from 12 to 26, Paul's going to tell about his situation when he's in the prison. So Paul is going to tell the Philippians about his situation in prison from 12 through 26. And what's interesting to me, only in uh, chapter 1, verse 27, does he start talking about the Philippians themselves. You know, here's Thanksgiving, here's my situation, now let's talk about you. And it takes 27 verses to get there. So, let's start with verse 3. He says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. Verse 4, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all. Now, I want you to think about this. He says he thanks God in all the remembrance of you. Now, I think of Baron and being the preacher here. And if he wrote a letter to you, wouldn't it be nice that he can think about you and say, I thank my God in my remembrance of you. Wouldn't that be good? And vice versa. We should be the same thing for everybody. And our brothers and sisters, when we look at it and think about you, it would be nice to say, I thank my God in all my remembrances of you. And then he goes on to say, always offering prayer. The, that term there is one of supplication. That uh, Paul is praying for the needs of others. He is always offering prayer with joy. Joy is a deep satisfaction in the Lord. He's offering with joy in my every prayer for all of you. And before we go on to the next verse, I want you to make sure you understand that Paul is in prison, possibly awaiting death. And yet he's not saying, dear father, send somebody to release you from jail, you know. He's not thinking of himself to get out of himself out of there. He's thinking of his brothers and sisters. I find that amazing. Don't you? Yeah. Would, could, could we? Let me ask you this. Could we be the same? When we talk about peace, did he have peace in jail? Sure. And why is he offering prayer and joy in every prayer? Because in verse 5 it says, In view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now, because he's thinking about it's now been 10 years. I visited them twice. And look at that. And, and their participation, that word participation, the koinonia, which we know as fellowship, it doesn't mean a Sunday dinner. We're talking about the joint participation. They're in this together. And you're the participation in the gospel. What's the gospel? If they're going to participate in the gospel, we should know what the gospel is. What's the gospel? Somebody look up while I'm writing here. Somebody look up uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. So let me just say this to you. The Greek word for gospel is euangelion. So you always means good or well. Like when Farron goes to a funeral and he gives a eulogy, you is good, 
Logia is words. So he's speaking good words about someone who has acts. Okay? So euangelion is a good message. Make sense? The gospel is a good message of Jesus Christ. Now, who's got 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4? Colleen, right? Go ahead, please. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, now that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Okay. In the synopsis, the gospel message is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And because he rose from the dead, we can raise from the dead and live in him forever. That's the gospel message. Now, I know I'm not teaching anything new there. We all understand that. But that's in, you know, we take four verses to condense it. But let me say this to you. I think there's over 31 or 32,000 scripture verses in these 66 books of the mind of the living God. And I'm here to tell you, it's all good news. In the large version, it's all good news. So he is offering prayer and joining every prayer for all in view of their participation in the gospel from the first day until now. So again, we said 10 years ago, he worked with the, the Philippians. And now he's writing 10 years later, knowing that they have a joint participation, they have something in common, that they are sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. Now, it could be part of their participation is the money, because when we support missionaries abroad or wherever, aren't we participating in the gospel? Because if we don't participate and send them money, they can't do their job. So in a way, we're participating that way. But in the greater sense, that they were teaching and preaching Jesus Christ. And you wonder why Paul had so much love for these people, because they were with him and participating in what they were supposed to be doing, which was sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. Now, I'm going to tell you something else about this. Shouldn't we be doing the same? That's why I'm here, so that I teach you, so that you can teach others. And I continue to be taught. I still go to, I still go to the Bible study, and I still study every day because I love it. And I love learning, but I'm doing this so that you learn, so that you teach others, because that's how it goes. Philip and the eunuch. I bet the eunuch, when he went back to Ethiopia, I bet you he shared it. I bet he wasn't quiet about it. So then his job, I bet he became a teacher, and then those Ethiopians, hopefully they became teachers, and that's why the gospel keeps spreading. Is it our job to share the good news? Or do we say that's Farron's job because he's the preacher? Are you a saint? Amen. Tell me you're a saint. I love it. I heard, the other, I heard yesterday that uh, Dickie Chambers, uh, a good Christian man, Farron, you know Dickie, right? He signs his name, St. Dickie. I heard that. I didn't know that. But you're saying you're a Christian. And one other one. Guess what else you and I are? We're priests. Did you know that? Lynn, did you know you're a priest? I hope I'm not scaring you. <laughs> first Peter 2 9. I think it's first. It's either first or second. I think it's first Peter. Yeah. 
It says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, holy nation, a people for God's own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. See, in the worldly perception, a priest does all the work. He is in the service of God. And then we're the parishioners, we're the pew sitters. Well, and I'm here to tell you that we are priests. We are God's priests, a holy priesthood, and we have a duty to serve Almighty God. You have a question? I was going to say that kind of flips it. Just says, well, yeah, we're all priests. It is our response. All of our responsibilities. Yes. So yeah. Right. So we should not shirk those duties. We're in the greatest position in the world to be Christians. That's the greatest title you can ever have. But with that comes duties. And I mentioned before, there's 168 hours in a week. Uh, are there any golfers in here? Probably do golf, right? There you go. All right. I'll just use an example of golfers. I know golfers that they and they try. I just want you to imagine you go golfing one hour a week. Can you prove? You're not going to prove. That's just the way it goes. Because you're not in it long enough for the, the mind and the body to work together to figure it out. And I'm just going to say this to you, that we will never get better if we only spend one hour a week listening to Theron. As good as Theron is, as much as I like and respect him, we're not going to be better for the king if we spend one hour a week. We're not. So, what are we going to do about it? 